I ain't joking. Because I'm about ready to mess with you in a good way. I have really struggled with this message. Knowing I was going to preach it for about three weeks or so, maybe longer than that, the, the Lord just gave me a phrase. Usually, if he does that, we work together and we get a nice little flow going. That is not the way things uh, worked. And so I asked the Lord if he was getting enough sleep, why he wasn't on his game, you know, helping me out. Uh, but uh, I, I recognize that part of that uh, is spiritual warfare. <clears throat> because today we're talking about faith. And I've entitled our thoughts today, Eyes of Faith. What I want you to do as we begin to navigate through this today is I want you to think about your life, and you won't have to think very long because you'll know instinctively because of the Holy Spirit at work in you, you've got some areas of your life where you need to take a step of faith. And you start thinking about those right now because at the close of the service, I'm going to ask you to step out from where you're at and come down here as a demonstration to the Lord of God, I need to take a step of faith and I'm willing to take a step of faith in that area or those areas of my life uh, today. So uh, today we are speaking, as I said, on the subject of eyes of faith. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 14, John chapter 9. Mm. But as we begin, let's start by defining faith. What is faith? Well, Wayne Grudem uh, puts it very succinctly. He's a theologian of the Baptist persuasion and in his book, Systematic Theology, he defines faith this way, trust or dependence on God. Trust or dependence on God. Now, that may seem really quaint, but it is not. To take it a step further and to give a little more meat on the, the bones of this definition, I'd point you to Tim Keller uh, in his book, uh, God's Wisdom for Navigating Life, where he just takes a look at Proverbs uh, and he says this, trusting in God, or faith, means obeying his will whether we like it or not. It also means accepting what he allows to come into our lives whether we understand it or not. I am very sure that there are things happening in your life right now that you don't understand what's going on and why it's going on. And I am pretty sure that there are areas in your life where you know God is pulling you. God is maybe nudging you, and you don't like it. Those are areas where you need faith in God because when we trust in God, when we put our faith in God, it is that trust or dependence on God. That's what faith is is. Faith stretches us. Faith is what changes our lives because faith is the pathway that we walk to get to Jesus. And Jesus transforms our life. If you're going to try to get to Jesus apart from faith, you're never going to get to Jesus, which means your life will never be changed. Faith, as it were, is the, it's the oil of the engine of the Christian life. It's, it's what helps us to move, to stretch, and to grow with God. Here's another thing we need to understand. It's there in your notes. Biblical faith translates into action. We like to talk about faith as a noun. It is a noun and a verb. And when we talk about faith as a noun, we have to understand that it is never intended to only be a noun. It is, it is never intended to just be trust. Here's what Jesus would say, prove it. Prove it. We say that to God all the time, but we're uncomfortable when he says it to us. Shame on us. Do we really think he's going to fail? Well, we must, because that's why we're not stepping out, isn't it? Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> I'm glad you came to listen to me talk to myself. Woo! All right, here we go. Exodus 14. Now, this is, a, 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 I love the Old Testament. I love the narratives. That's my, it's the favorite. I just love it. It's, it's awesome stuff. Because these aren't stories. This is history. This is history. This happened. Like, you can go to this place on the earth. This happened. And so that's just one of the reasons that I love Christianity. It's rooted in history. Yeah, it's not just some abstract thing. 
We didn't have some prophet uh, that went off somewhere by himself and received some knowledge by himself and some tablets by himself that nobody else ever saw and that got lost. Sounds like Joseph Smith and a little bit like Muhammad. Both of them, same story. Now Jesus came and said, here I am. Check this out. See if it's real. See if it's true. Exodus 14. We're going to read several verses here, uh, 10 through 14, 19 through 25, and 30, and 31. So let's start at verse 10. This is the Israelites getting ready to cross the Red Sea. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked, and they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. And they cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, Leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Over to verse 19. Then the angel of God who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptians and the Israelite camp. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night. Verse 21. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. And so the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on the dry ground with walls of water on each side. Verse 23, then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and charioteers chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down on the Egyptian army from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here. Away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then over to verse 30. This is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day as And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on the seashore. And when the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him, and they put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Friends, we need to see a fresh revelation of God in our lives. I can look at your life and I I could say, oh, that person needs faith. I'm not asking you to look at me and say that today. I'm not asking you to look at anybody else but yourself because you know it's true in your heart of hearts. You need some fresh faith so that you can see some fresh fire in your life. And you're not going to get it no matter how hard I try to get it for you. You have got to take a step of faith for yourself. This passage beautifully illustrates where I want to begin today. It was on Monday afternoon or Monday morning, one of those two, of this last week where I just believe that the the Lord uh, showed me this uh, with regard to this whole concept of faith and the eyes of faith. And, And it's this, many times God does not show us what's going on in situations in our life because he doesn't want us looking at our situations, he wants us to look at him. And so he will, my prayer Since Monday has been, God, blind me to everything in my life except you. Because I'm an American. I'm distracted. I got a stupid smartphone that belongs under the wheels of a scraper on a construction site. Hate it. Did you know that the average American touches, the average American touches their smartphone screen over 2,400 times per day. Don't tell me that we don't have addictive problems. Don't tell me that, that we are distracted. And that's what happens in our life and in the life of faith. Here we are and we're trying to find God, but we're so distracted we can't even pray for two minutes. We can't even handle 60-second commercials on television. 
It just drives us nuts because we're so distracted. But you see, God wants us to not see everything that's going on around us. He wants us to see him. And so let's take a look at faith's focus first, and then we're going to uh, look at three ways, uh, that, three things that we can do to open the eyes of faith uh, as we work with God in our own lives. First of all, faith's focus. The first thing that faith is focused on is God's identity. This is about believing who God is. This is about believing who God is, and this is what Moses did. He said, stand there and watch and see your God deliver you. You walked out of Egypt, and did you hear them, by the way? Did you hear them saying, why did you bring us out of Egypt? Do you know what slavery was like in Egypt for the Israelites? And yet here they are, several days after they leave, oh, Send us back because now we're going to die free people. You know the greatest enemy of freedom? Freedom. We're experiencing that in America right now. And the Israelites, here they are. They're looking at their circumstances. They see the Red Sea. They see the Egyptian army coming. They're looking at this nincompoop named Moses who who said it was God who delivered them and sent ten plagues apparently. They all saw it. And they want to go back to Egypt and die there. Where was Moses looking? Don't be afraid. And watch your God work. He was looking at who God was. Who is God? God is our creator. God is our redeemer. God is our baptizer in the spirit. God is our healer. God is our provider. Jehovah Jireh. God is our righteousness. That's Jehovah Sidkenu. He is our victory. Jehovah Nisi, our banner. Banner meaning victory. God is holy. He is righteous. He is our teacher. He is the one who guides us into all truth. He is our peace. Jehovah Shalom. And you could go on and on and on and on about who God is. God revealed himself to his people, and as he did, he would show them what he was doing. And friends, who is God? you got to get that settled in your heart and life, but you're never going to understand who God is until you take a step of faith and you begin to get your focus right. And you begin to say, listen, I am not going to look at everything that's going on around me. I am going to look at the one who is in this with me. We need to have our focus on who God is, on God's identity. And secondly, we need to look at God's ability. God's ability. This is about believing what God can do. Can you imagine the Israelites? Put yourself there. You're not Moses. And he says, don't be afraid. Pause. Most powerful army in the the world is right there. Right there. Don't be afraid. The Red Sea is right there. They've got chariots and horses. We got feet and legs. Have you ever tried to chase a wild animal in the woods? They've got better lungs and they've got more legs. They are faster and they can get further quicker than you ever can. I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is. And the Israelites had to, be, had to have been thinking that. And yet, what did they say? They're, they're, they're sitting there focused on everything. And what does Moses do? He says, watch your God. When was the last time you challenged somebody to watch God work? You see, that takes faith. And that's what Moses did. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you think that's what it was like? I don't. I think Moses knew God's ability. He was convinced that God was their deliverer and that God had brought them out of Egypt And that God was going to continue to deliver them. And he says, watch what your God does and watch him destroy this army before your sight today. What is God able to do? Well, he keeps providing. He owns everything and yet he gives some to you. Then he only asks for 10% of that back when it comes to money. And we complain about that when he's extraordinarily said, you have 90%. Just give me 10. Isn't that amazing how, how it works? He's the one who heals us. He's the one who saves us. He does the miraculous. Do you have a financial need in your life today? In your household, it seems insurmountable. You don't know how it's going to work. You don't know how the bills are going to get paid. You don't know how how that's going to come true. You got a vision problem. 
Because you need to look at the God who is able. Do you, do you see somebody in your life who's got a hardened heart and they're far from God and they seem to just keep drifting and over time as you've watched them, you just think their heart has become so hard that you've even stopped praying for them because there's no way that God could redeem that. They've, just, they've been given over, or whatever other verse you would quote. They're not chosen, whatever. You, you have forgotten about the ability of God to reach to the depths, the lowest depths of a person's heart and to grab them by the heart and to redeem their life. Do you have a dream that God has put in your heart and you don't know how it's ever going to happen because it costs too much? You don't have enough time left. You don't have enough breaths left in your lungs. God is able. I just finished reading a book by David Green, Giving It All Away and Getting It All Back Again. Learning about generosity from David Green, who is the uh, founder and CEO of uh, Hobby Lobby. <clears throat> Tells the story in there several years ago. Uh, he was at a church service and he heard, a mission, he heard a guy talking about, who was involved with missions, talking about a project that they had. It was about the Book of Hope. The guy's name was Bob Hoskins, happened to be an Assemblies of God guy. And so the Book of Hope is all about taking the New Testament and making it very readable for kids and then distributing the book of hope in schools. We're not here to bring you the Bible. We're bringing, here to bring you the story of Jesus. So they put it in book form, and it's the book of hope. David Green goes to Bob Hoskins after the, the, the presentation, and he says, I want to meet with you. So they meet in David Green's office. He says, tell me more about the book of hope. And so Bob Hoskins tells him and uh, all about it, and David Green sits down, and he says, here's what I want to do. I want to partner with you starting today. And I'm, I'm going to give you a check for $2 million right here. Whew, writes him a check, hands it to Bob Hoskins. Bob Hoskins goes home. He's in Oklahoma. Right about the same time, Bob's son, Rob, has been summoned by a missionary in the Philippines to Manila to meet with the minister of education about the possibility of getting some books of hope in the Philippine schools. Rob Hoskins goes over there with his missionary. He meets with the minister of education in Manila and presents everything. And the minister of education looks at Rob Hoskins and he says, that's an amazing presentation. Sounds like a great endeavor. But we tend to fashion our government uh, here after America. And in 1963, America began to remove God from its public schools. And we would see this as a breach of that. Rob Hoskins thinks very quickly with the help of the Holy Spirit. And he begins to say, did you know that since 1963... Drug use has escalated. Alcohol abuse is off the charts. Teen pregnancies are, are through the roof. Depression is on the rise. He quotes all of these statistics. The minister of education is taken aback. And he says, that's interesting because we're seeing those same things in our culture. He says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rubber stamp a letter for you with my signature on it. And we're going to get this done. Can you get this done, Rob Hoskins? Rob knows that he can't get it done. They don't have the money at the Book of Hope. But he says, yes, we can get books of hope into your school system. Rob Hoskins gets on the plane. He calls his dad back in Oklahoma. He says, Dad, guess what? I got good news and I got bad news. The good news is that Manila wants the Book of Hope in their schools. The bad news is we need $2 million that we don't have to get the project done. And Bob reaches over on the nightstand as he's on the phone and his son is on the airplane and he says, Son, I want to let you know that today David Green from Hobby Lobby invested in the Book of Hope and he wrote me a check for $2 million. And the dream comes true. Why? Because somebody was focused on God's ability and not his not the, the circumstances, inability. Friends, if we're going to have eyes of faith, we got to see God's identity. We have to know who he is, and we also need to understand what God can do through his ability. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Do you have a dream in your heart? Do you think it can be accomplished? Then it's not big enough. you got to find yourself something impossible, something that cannot be done in the power of men, and you got to start believing. you got to start taking steps of faith in that direction of your life. You say, why would I do that? Because that's the Red Sea in your life. And you don't need the enemy overwhelming you. You need God to part the waters in a way that only he can do because God is able. That's who our God is. 
You see, the truth about the eyes of faith is that the, the eyes of faith are always looking forward. The eyes of faith look for God in every situation. The eyes of faith are focused on solutions and not on problems. Friend, don't you want to see some fresh faith at work in your life? Don't you want to see some things in the supernatural happen in your life? Aren't you tired of complaining about how big the problems are and how small your God is and how short your prayers are and how anemic your devotional time with God is? Aren't you tired of that? Then start stepping by faith one day at a time, one second at a time, one dollar at a time, one minute at a time in the direction of God and get your faith at work. Get your spectacles on and get the blur off of what's around you and begin to look at God in fresh, new ways. And so how do we open our eyes of faith? Well, John chapter 9, verses 39 to 41, here's what it says. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and they asked, are you saying that we are blind. These are the church people. Are you saying we're blind? Jesus said, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. But you remain guilty because you think that you can see. Ouch. Love Jesus. How do we open our eyes of faith? Number one, we got to stand against the issue. Stand against the issue. We see this in Moses. In Exodus 14, face the issue. Turn and face that issue. Face that pending bankruptcy. Face that that pending financial crisis. Face it. For us as a congregation, we we got plenty of these. Face the fact that we're undermanned on our teams. Face the fact that we're understaffed some days of the week, if not all days of the week. Face the fact that we don't have the money in the bank that we need to start building a new worship facility. Face the fact that we don't have the money in the bank to get some campuses going throughout the region. Face the fact. Face it. Stop running from it. Moses was standing on the shores of the Red Sea. He didn't turn his back on the Red Sea. He faced it. David did not run from Goliath like the rest of Israel. David faced Goliath. Nehemiah did not stay in Babylon. He went back to Jerusalem and he faced a wall that was torn down. Esther faced annihilation, extermination, and the extermination of the Jewish people. She faced the problem. Jesus faced the cross. The disciples, after the ascension of Christ, they faced opposition, they faced persecution, they faced imprisonment, and they faced death. They faced it. Why? Because they were people of faith. They were looking with the eyes of faith. And you will never be able to see God if you will not face your issue. Because you think that the way to God is away from the issue. That's what I think. But the way to God is to face your issue because God has gifted you that issue, that impossibility. It is a gift from heaven. Not that it might overwhelm you, but that you might stand fast and see the salvation of your God and watch him overwhelm that impossibility. You got to stand and face the issue. Secondly, you got to state the truth. State the truth. Call out to God. Let him be your help. Start telling the truth. Oh, what's the truth? God is able. Start there. All right? Start there. Get into God's Word. Read God's Word. Memorize it. Listen to it. Saturate yourself with it. Do whatever you must do, but speak the truth. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Business of Heaven, he said this, One must keep on pointing out that Christianity is a statement which, if false, is of no importance. And if true, is of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. You see, what he's saying is this. We don't follow Christ. We don't don't practice Christianity because it's good. We practice Christianity because it's true. And the truth matters. And if we stand and face the issues in our life and we begin to speak the truth in the midst of the situations, in the midst of the stuff, in the midst of the trials, in the midst of it all, that's when God comes through. We got to speak the truth. What did Moses say? 
Moses said, he put him, he said, God, you got to come through. And God put himself between the Egyptians and the Israelites in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. David didn't see a Philistine giant. He saw a mighty God. And he said, I'm going to cut your head off today. And I am going to take, I'm going to do it with your sword. And that's exactly what that little teenage boy did. Nehemiah didn't look at a broken down wall. He saw a God who was able to do exceedingly abundantly far and above all that he could ever ask or imagine. And in 52 days, they did the miraculous and rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. Jesus didn't see just five loaves and two fish and 5,000 people. He saw an opportunity for the Father to prove that he was the provider to these people. And so he took what he had, he offered it to God, and God did the miracle. What were they all doing? Practicing truth. You see, the disciples saw a sealed tomb. But then when they looked in, they said, oh, it's empty. And what did they do? They ran from the tomb. And they weren't quiet. They were telling everybody that the tomb was empty. How come we're not? We need to stand and face the issue and then state the truth. And number three, we need to step out. We need to take that step of faith. Step out. What does this mean? It means that you've got to move. You've got to do something that you're not currently doing in that thing. If all you've been doing is praying about that financial miracle, start putting some money toward that, that need. If you've, just been, if, if you've just been taking the medicine for your illness and you haven't been praying, you've got to start praying and vice versa. Sometimes that's the way it works. If you want reconciliation with somebody, keep praying for their heart to change, but you step in their direction. You grab your phone. Don't send them a text. You call them. I don't have their number. Find it. Give them a call. Let them hear your voice. Take a step in that direction. Do something that you're not currently doing because this is faith. You see, God's desire for you and for me is that we would open our eyes of faith, that we would stop looking at all of the stuff around us, at all of the reasons why God can't do what He wants to do in our household, in our neighborhood, in our school systems, in central Montana. And we need to start looking not only at who God is, but what He can do. And that's where our focus needs to be so that we can take that step of faith because God wants an east wind to blow in your life. He wants that wind to blow and to part that Red Sea for you. He wants you to walk through that sucker, look into both sides and see the walls. The walls of circumstance beside you while you walk through on dry ground. That's what God wants you to see. And that's where the eyes of faith are going to take you. When a blind man, a blind man couldn't see Jesus coming in John 9. He heard that he was coming. What did he do? He stepped in Jesus' direction. And what happened? Jesus healed the man's eyes. Friends, you got to take a step. It's time that we begin to open our eyes of faith in some fresh and new ways. It's time that we shake off the past and maybe all of our failures of faith. Those are learning, by the way. You've learned a lot. And it's time for us in the Exodus 14 moments or seasons of our own lives to say, don't be afraid. Stand fast and see the salvation of your God. Will you stand with me this morning? Faith makes us uncomfortable. I asked you at the beginning to think about some things in your life, some areas where you just know that you got to take a step of faith. Not faith in you, not faith in me, faith in God. You've got to step in His direction. If you know that God is calling on you today to open your eyes of faith in a brand new way, I want you to step out from where you're at. Just join me here at the front. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to be dismissed as we go with eyes wide open. Eyes wide open. And this is just a a, a physical gesture of something that we are anticipating on the inside that, God, I'm going to move in, a, in an area of my life. I'm going, to, I'm going to take a step of faith. i got to adjust my time. i got to adjust 
my, my schedule so that I can start moving in your direction. Jesus, this altar is filled right now with impossibilities. Some of us have faced ridicule. We face we, we faced the opposition of the enemy bludgeoning us every day as we try to live by faith. Some of us to the point where we've quit and we've given up. But God, you didn't pull us out of Egypt so that we could die on the shores of the Red Sea. That's for the corpse of the enemy. God, you brought us to this Red Sea that we might walk through it to the other side and we might rejoice that you are our deliverer. And so God, today, we come and we bring this stuff. We bring these circumstances, these sicknesses, these financial impossibilities, these dreams in our heart, these relationships. And God, we, we're going to step in your direction. Give us eyes to see what we have not been able to see. Blind us. Blind us by your spirit to the circumstance and open our eyes afresh and anew to you. May we see you in fresh and new ways, I pray, through the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I would ask and pray that as we stand and face the issue, as we begin to declare truth, as we begin to saturate our minds and our hearts in new ways with the truth that you are able, that God, we would we would find ourselves invigorated in the face of all opposition, doing what Moses did, doing what Nehemiah did, doing what you did on the cross and taking a step of faith. And God may hell suffer great harm all throughout central Montana because we are willing to believe not in ourselves but in you. So God, we open our eyes to you today and we pray that you would nurture this seed of faith that is in the soil of our hearts this morning. And we bless your holy name for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You got to leave this place with your eyes wide open. If you don't, you're going to trip down the steps. Don't do that. Don't do that. Leave with your eyes of faith wide open to the Lord. If you're members, remember to come back at 1215 for the annual meeting. Blessings on you as you go today.